Next, what we want to do is ask is expand this this question a little bit further, and ask what if you have more than one thing to allocate to. So in all of the var examples we've done, like in the first example, it was all of his money in one place, U.S. large cap. So we had a a mean and standard deviation for that. Here we just had a new portfolio with a mean and standard deviation. But what happens if you have two or three things you're looking at? How do you figure out how to allocate that? And so here's a very form, famous formula in finance, um, maybe one of the most fa famous formulas in finance. It's not really just finance, it applies to other fields as well. But we use it all the time in finance. And let's say if you have two asset classes, A and B, and you wanna know what is the standard deviation of our portfolio if we have a portfolio of A and B only. And the way you calculate it is you take your weight of A, what percentage you have in A, you square that, times the standard deviation of A, you square that. Then you take the weight of how much you have in B and square that. Now the weight of A plus the weight of B must be equal to 100%. So you square that, then you get the standard deviation of that squared. So weight of A squared times standard deviation of A squared, weight of B squared times standard deviation of B squared, then 2 times weight A, weight B, standard deviation A, standard deviation B, and then this last thing, correlation. I'm hoping you have a good memory of correlation from your statistics class. It's an extremely important number for finance. Um, not as important as some other fields, but in finance, very, very, very important function in finance. <clears throat> um, correlation is what gives what we call the efficient frontier its shape. Let me show you how... I'm, I'm not going to... For the sake of time, I might I might do this um, a little bit later. We'll see. Uh, I'm really eager to get on to the asset valuation exercises. But um, I take this formula, and let me show you how I use it in a spreadsheet. So here's a spreadsheet I use in my risk management class, and it's it's got several pages to it. Again, there's that hyperlink I used to like to use. So here's the actual model. So the top part of the model are assumptions. So I have large companies that are growth companies, large companies that are value companies. If you take my investment class, we go through that. But these are just different stocks in the United States that are separated between those that are fast growing but expensive and those that are slow growing but cheap stocks. Same thing for small companies. And we go to international, we go to developed markets like uh, UK and France and Australia. There are emerging countries like China and uh, the Philippines and Brazil. Gold is a commodity. We could have added other commodities in here. And then just regular old bonds, good investment grade bonds. And we're going to talk about bonds next and how to value bonds. And we get into bonds quite a bit in my investment class. And then uh, we, we, have, we have a new class that's been added. Um, I'm hoping John Tui will continue teaching that class. It's really, really valuable if we could get him and teach it specifically on bonds. If that class is still offered, I would strongly recommend you take that. Maybe not next semester, but uh, after you take principles of investments, you'd be ready to take that class. And then high yield bonds are bonds that are very low rated. They're what we call junk bonds. So they're a little bit dangerous, but they have a higher expected return than regular bonds, but they have more risk. And then down here is the correlation. So large cap growth, correlation of large cap growth is one. But then you can see the different correlations. The lower the correlation, like here we actually have a negative number, the lower the correlation, the more risk reduction we have because what we're doing is diversifying our portfolio. Now here's the actual model. You'll have to take my risk class R. There's actually actually videos that walk through this entire thing. So you can go out and find those videos or if you want to link to it, you want to practice it before you take my risk class and try to get ahead on that class, you can certainly do that. And down here are the calculations. So we have the expected return. The expected return is just the return for each one of those asset classes times its weight. So if we have 26% in large cap growth, 20, the 34% in small cap value, 20% in developed, 20% in emerging, and we weight those across, we have an expected return of 9.4%. And then the risk, what we do with risk, it's all the rest of this. We're taking that formula I just showed you, weight of A squared times weight of B. We do that first, the weight squared times the risk, and then down here we do the last part of that equation. Two times weight of A, weight of B, risk of A, risk of B, correlation of A and B. 
We have to do that with every asset class. So we have to do it with, with A versus B. We have to do it for A versus C, A versus D. Then we have to do it B versus C, B versus D. And that's what's going on down here. I'm doing that two times the weight square, take time two times the weight of A, weight of B. And you'll see that formula all the way down. And when we do that formula, it gives us the standard deviation of the portfolio. So I'm using that formula. And then here's the actual uh, efficient frontier. This is the portfolio my client started with, and this is the portfolio I'm recommending to them. You can see at the get down here is risk. Over here is return. I should have I should have titled these X's, but um, but you can see at essentially the same level of risk, it has a much higher return. And so uh, and you notice there's a historical VAR in here. So we talk about parametric VAR and historical VAR. So you can see in my risk class, we get into that more. More detail that USA we use parametric VAR and stochastic VAR. We never use historical VAR, but we could have. So you can see how this is used in practice. When I was at USA, I built a model just like this. USA had a model that we were acquiring from a firm. It cost us several thousand dollars a year, and we got rid of that model and just built our own. And you can build it yourself and do your own efficient frontier. If you want to be able to do this, you don't have to take my risk management class. You can just ask for the YouTube videos that walk you through how to use this particular file, and you can, you can create your own. But anyway, that's that's the theory. I'm just sitting, scratching the surface. You won't be tested on this. It's really good to be able to do. Uh, I do recommend that you be able to build an efficient frontier from scratch with a blank spreadsheet. Um, I don't know if I have a video of that or not. If we have time left over to enter the class, that's one of the things I'll add to bring in at the end. So value risk is our measure of risk, our mitigation of price risk. Remember, we're talking about price risk. We started this whole thing on price risk, and we said, how is it defined? It's that asset values fall or liability prices rise. How do we measure it? Our main measure right now is parametric value at risk. How do we mitigate it? You saw in the Excel applications that we're using risk budgets. The other thing we do that's not in Excel app applications is correlation or diversification. So diversification is probably the most used uh, tool in finance for controlling risk. Diversification is probably the more common way here it's defined. Um, I'm skeptical of correlation, and there's other skeptical of correlation. Um, if you have that time this summer, I do have a blog where I talk about correlation and diversification. Does it really work? So I encourage you to read through that blog. It's um, it's an interesting blog. I think I ask some fairly heretical questions, and you might be surprised at my answer. Um, and it's not just I'm not the only one saying these kind of things. I show you two examples in that blog of others that are asking the same question. Can you really manage risk of a portfolio by relying on diversification? So a good example is 2008. In 2008, people thought they were diversified because they had some money in stocks and some money in bonds. Well, in 2008, stocks and bonds were both down a bunch, except for treasury bonds. And most people don't have treasuries. They have other types of bonds. But in 2008, if you had the bonds that most people buy, which are corporate bonds, corporate bonds and stocks were both down dramatically in 2008. So diversification didn't help you at all. U.S. stocks were down. Large cap stocks were down. Small cap stocks were down. International stocks were down. Bonds, everything but treasuries were down. So correlation, diversification just did not help you. And that's one of my problems with finance is our, our risk tools work very well unless we need them as in a crisis. In a crisis, the main tools we use in risk management just do not work. Um, they blow up at that time. The worst possible time for them to blow up, they blow up. So here's another example. Um, here I'm using a one, let's see if you remember it because we just talked about it. I'm using a 1% risk tolerance, so it's a 2.33 event. So 6% is the mean expected return. 2.33 is 
the number of standard deviations equated with a 1% uh, risk tolerance. 9% is the, is the standard deviation. That gives me a value at risk of 14.97%. It's a $100 million portfolio, so I multiply that out and I get 14.97 million. My risk budget is 12 million. It's not meeting my requirement. So this portfolio is expected to lose 14.97 million or more 1% of the time. That all more is really important. We don't, we actually almost never expect to lose exactly 14.97 million. So the 1% of the time we expect to lose $14.97 million or more. The budget's only 12, 12 million, so we don't we don't have we don't have uh, a budget, we're not in compliance with our budget. We hope that low correlation reduces risk. I talk about that up here. Is people like gold in their portfolio because gold does really well in a crisis. Gold has a very low expected return, but it has high standard deviation. And a high standard deviation actually helps you because that means when stocks and bonds are down 20, 30 percent, gold might be up 15, 20, 30, 50 percent. Gold did pretty well during the uh, coronavirus. Um, it, it does well whenever the dollar weakens and it does well during a major crisis. So that's, that's pretty good. Uh, long treasury, long U.S. treasuries, long-term treasuries, they do extremely well in a crisis. That's what people like to buy. They were up like 25, 30, 40 percent in 2008, so they would have helped you. Now, long-term treasuries will help you in a crisis, but they will not help if inflation is a problem. So if you have high inflation, long-term treasuries will do really badly. We talked about that in my principles of investment class. However, gold will do really well with inflation size. So you can see how gold sometimes really helps in a crisis. Sometimes long-term treasury helps you in a crisis, uh, but it just it just depends on the situation. If you listen to my, if you want, read my blog, you'll you'll hear me talking about this concept of environments and when one asset class does well versus another asset, and how you really want to make sure you have not just regular stocks and bonds, but you you look at some of these other assets to try to help you on those extreme cases. So low correlation means good risk reduction but it relies heavily on correlation being a predictable, forecastable thing. The problem is during a crisis, most correlations for more, most risky assets move to one. That is, in a crisis, if you have U.S. stocks and European stocks and Asian stocks, and you're hoping that's going to diversify your portfolio, it will, unless you get a crisis like we're in right now, and everything falls to um, you know, 25 30%. And that diversification doesn't help you one bit. <clears throat> so what do we do about this? Most financial planners just ignore this. And they just hope for the best. Which means what they're telling your clients is true, except in a crisis. And in, our, in a crisis, their clients are going to lose a whole lot more money than they expected. So they might tell them, hey, we'll, put your, we'll do your portfolio and we'll get within your risk tolerance, or into your risk budget of $12 million. So 1% of the time, you'll only, we'll, we'll fix this portfolio so it's not out of compliance. It'll be right at $12 million. And you're right. At normal times, at 1% risk tolerance, well, 12, 12 million will be about right. But if you go into a crisis, that portfolio might lose $47 million or $70 million. I've seen some cases where the value risk was $35 million. I mean, you won't believe me when I say this, but... Um, there's a firm called Long-Term Capital Management. Their value at risk was $35 million. That was the most they expected to lose. They lost $600 and something million dollars in one day, something that would, would have been considered impossible by the statistics they were using. So that's the downside of this is rely on these statistics. These statistics tend to act really unusually in a crisis, and you may be kidding your client or kidding yourself if you're looking at your own money. Is it getting worse? I think assets around the world are getting more correlated. So diversification is not helping as well. As well. In my risk management class, I tackle this. And there's some famous people in finance who disagree with me. And I take them on and I argue that. That's why I like that class so much. Because we take on some pretty current issues. And I'm willing to step out and, and risk talking heresy to get students just to think about risk. Because this is probably the most important thing you do in finance is talk about risk. Standard deviation is also unstable over time. So we might tell our, our clients that the stock market has a standard deviation of 18%. But 
but what we've seen the last few days, um, the market has moved much more wildly than anything we would have expected given th those assumptions. So again, we tell our clients what their risk is and then we get into a crisis and you throw all of that and none of it, none of it works. All right, so one last review. Parametric risk is what we're using. It's just this very, very simple formula. Historical and stochastic risk is when you run scenarios. Historical, you run scenarios based on history. You just bring in historical data and, and run that through your model. Stochastic, you actually create a Monte Carlo type of simulation where you create completely brand new scenarios that you run against um, your business and see how much you can lose. Um, so value risk assumes some probability, like 1%. You've got to do that. Um, you have to come up with that 1%. Anything that happens less frequently than 1%, you say we're just going to assume it never happens. It's an Intel event that only happens less than 1% of the time. Um, I do the exact opposite. So value risk says ignore those tele events that happen less frequently than 1%. My approach is that's what I'm most worried about, especially now that I'm, you know, I'm retired, I'm living off my portfolio. I get a little income from UTSA, but most of my, my money is coming from my portfolio. I worry about tele events. I worry about things like the coronavirus and those type of events. So I'm worried about those major, major uh, crises. And if you think about it, we had one in 2000, we had one in 2008, now we have one in 2020. These things happen. The statistics say they should happen once every 100 years, once every 200 years, and we're having one about every decade. So they happen much more frequently. So what I do is I figure out what's the most I'm willing to lose, and I use something called options that we won't talk about in this class. I do cover them in my investment class and my risk management class. I use options. Options are like buying insurance on your investment portfolio so that if a major crisis happens, you can guarantee the max amount you're going to lose. I prefer that approach. What I say is in, instead of ignoring the tells because they happen so infrequently, I instead just cut the tells off so I don't have to worry about them. I, I had a, a managed future trader come from the UK over to talk to us at USAA, and he went through his entire spiel, and most, most hedge fund managers talk about VAR all the time. This manager never talked about VAR, so I just asked him. I'm not a big fan of value at risk, but I just asked him, why didn't you give us your value at risk? And he, this is what he told me. I got his permission to actually repeat, repeat, repeat this story. But he said, before we use value at risk, risk was like a cliff, and everybody stayed a safe distance away from the cliff. So people were worried about risk, so they just didn't take the risk because they were scared of it, so they stayed away. Then valued risk came in. We now have this new fancy way we could actually measure, measure risk. So he said valued risk was like a fence we built along the cliff. And now everybody has confidence to go up and lean against that cliff. The only problem is when everybody's doing the same thing because now they feel confident because we can measure risk. Every once in a while, the entire fence collapses. That's what happened in 2008. Everybody was doing very similar things, relying on very similar statistics, and the whole thing fell apart, collapsed, and it caused a major crisis. All right, so what we'll do in our last session for this class is I want to talk a few other risks and then I probably will introduce valuation, asset valuation, because we don't have many classes left, and there's some pretty tough calculations we need to do uh, for the remaining part of the class. We make sure we get that. The last, you only have two Excel applications left to go. Um, one is a bond valuation, and we'll do that next class. I might introduce it to the next session. You have a couple there, and then you have a stock valuation, and we're going to do the stock valuations. The math there is not too tough. But I also want you to do an Excel data table just in case you've never done one of those before. And so we've got a couple of things. So it's going to be pretty intense. The last two, it's going to be a lot of Excel work. So you probably won't need, when we do those, we won't need to do much as far as giving your class notes because we'll be spending most of your time in Excel building what you need to build for the Excel application.